Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 1, verse 1, the prologue. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And may God speak to us today through his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. Cur Deus Homo, a rather unusual title for a message, no doubt, especially because it is, of course, in Latin. But I'm trusting that all of you reached back into your high school or junior high school Latin and pulled up enough to decipher that title. Deus certainly ought to be easy enough. We used that word in song just a few moments ago, in excelsis Deo, at least a form of that word, which, of course, means God. Now, homo shouldn't be too much difficulty if we simply think about homo sapiens, because we is it. And that, of course, refers to man, but cur. Dog? No. That means why. Therefore, we have why God man, which happens to be the title of one of the greatest of the Christian classics, written exactly 900 years ago at this very time by St. Anselm who was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Why did God become man? Now today, before you even try to answer a question like that, you would have to settle the surprise in the eyes and minds of some people at the very idea that God did become man. Though this is the central foundational fact of Christianity, we live in a time when there are many people that suppose Christmas is about the birthday of Santa Claus. And certainly would be the farthest thought from their mind that it has anything to do with God becoming man. And yet that's exactly what the incarnation is all about, God incarnate. And we all know what that means. At least many people would know what chili con carne means. That's chili beans with meat. God incarnate is God in meat, in human flesh. And that's what Christians all believe. But why? 
Why did God become man? Why was it necessary that the infinitely glorious, omnipotent creator of all of the universe that fashioned the galaxies should step out of his ivory palace into the filth of a stable and become man? Well, we hear a lot of ideas about it which we might look at and weigh in comparison to what the Archbishop taught us. <clears throat> For example, this is a story that seems to come around about every Christmas time that you probably have heard before. It's about a Christmas Eve in the upper Midwest where several feet of snow blanketed the landscape. And the family in this, uh, this godly farming family had left their home to go to a Christmas Eve service. All that is except Father, who was of a skeptical bent of mind and really had little patience with this nonsense about God becoming man and believed the whole thing to be nothing more than a myth for which there was no earthly purpose that he could conceive of. And so, while the family is off at church worshiping, he is smoking his pipe and reading a book, when suddenly there is a thump on the glass window of his home. And then another one. And he gets up and walks over to this plate glass window and looks out and there at the base of the window are two birds fluttering in the snow. He returns to his book only to be disturbed again and again and finally walking once more to the window he sees now that there is a whole flock of birds out there in the snow. And he says to himself, well those poor stupid little birds are going to freeze to death out there in the snow all night. Aha! His hard heart at least softened at the plight of these birds. He says, I will open the great doors of my barn and invite them in where it's warmer, where they will not die. And so he goes outside, puts on his coat first and scarf and gloves and opens the great doors of his barn and then comes over and tries to shoo the birds into the barn which of course are immediately terrified and fly off in all directions. He is somewhat frustrated about that and shortly thereafter they return again and he has a brilliant idea that what he'll do is get some corn and, and make a path to the barn and that will no doubt attract them in. However, one factor that he had not considered and that is that unfortunately all birds have bird brains and uh, such deductive logic was apparently beyond them. And that didn't work either. And as he is standing there, looking out the window, scratching his head, wishing that there were some way that he could communicate with these birds, he said to himself, if I could, if I could just become a bird, I'd tell them that I don't want to hurt them or scare them. I want them to come into my barn where they'll, be, where they'll be warm and safe. And suddenly, the church bells pealed in the distance and the light went on in his mind. Oh, that's why God became man in order that he could tell us of his love and assure us that he only wanted to bring us into his barn that we might be safe forever. How lovely. Well, it's a beautiful story, no doubt, and there is certainly an element of some truth in it. And yet, my friends, light years from the real truth, can he who made the ear not hear, and he that fashioned the mouth not speak? God does not have the limitations of man. Did not God walk in the garden and conversed with Adam and Eve? Did he not speak in audible tones there to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai? 
Did he not communicate with mankind for centuries through his prophets? And could he not communicate in a thousand other ways, even speaking directly to our minds if he saw fit to do it? He doesn't have the limitations of a farmer. He is the omnipotent God. And so the story falls far short of the great truth of cur deus homo, why God became man. A second idea that we often hear is that God became man because there is this great longing and desire in the hearts of men that they might see God. The beatific vision, it's called. Job said, oh, that I might know where I could find him and go and see him and speak to him face to face. If we could but see God, we would know how we ought to live. So said Socrates, they worshiped truth, goodness, and beauty, and felt that if only man could see perfect truth and perfect goodness and perfect beauty, then immediately man would know how he ought to live his life and would gladly and delightedly follow in that path. And so, one day, truth descended from heaven and became incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who is truth incarnate and goodness as well. For in him there was found no sin. Which of you convinceth me of sin, he said. He is the crystal Christ, the son of righteousness, in whom there is not the slightest stain of iniquity. And beauty, ah, he is the altogether lovely one, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the delightful one, the perfect one in whom all is in perfect symmetry, every quality of human virtue was in perfect balance in him. And so he came and walked among us. And when we saw him, we hated him. And with rough hands, we took him and threw him on the ground and nailed him to a cross because he was a mirror that showed us our wrinkles and our warts and our ugliness and our sin. And so we nailed him to a tree, and then we buried him in the ground out of sight and mind. Socrates knew little or nothing about the true depths of the depravity of the human heart. No, our condition requires something far greater than a perfect exemplar, exemplar like Christ. That is not the ultimate reason, cur deus homo. Thirdly, you hear people say that, and I've heard it a thousand times, oh, Jesus, Jesus was a great teacher. And that's why he came to teach us. And there is no doubt that he was not only a great teacher, he was the greatest teacher that ever taught. He was the paragon of pedagogic expertise. I think of one skeptic who set, a, a, set about to write a book in which he was going to debunk Christ and get rid of the idea of his deity. And as he began to do his experimentation and his research and to read about this one, he was astonished right at the very first as he read about this man who was born in a stable, who lived in a country bumpkin town that was a byword, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, who never went to school, who never learned, whence hath this man these things having never learned, they said, who never went to college, who never went to university, who never had a degree, who never traveled, who then, emerged out of total obscurity 
walked up on a mountain and delivered the most monumental discourse on human ethics that the world had ever heard. The man was stunned. How can this be? So stunned indeed was he that the hardened veneer of his unbelief began to crack and soon he bowed the knee before Christ. Yes, Christ was the greatest teacher that ever lived. And let me sum up his teaching for you. Bring it all down to the bottom line and in one sentence tell you the very essence of what Jesus taught because surely you will want to know what is the essence of the teaching of the greatest teacher that ever lived. Here it is, the culmination of the teaching of Jesus Christ. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Ah, what radiant smiles are seen on your faces. You're delighted to hear that wondrous teaching. Now you know what you ought to do and what you ought to be. You ought to be just as perfect as God. Isn't education wonderful? Since 100% of you look less than thrilled, let me point out to you that Christ knew that that was the case. He said himself, before I spake my words, ye had a covering for your sin. But now ye have no cloak for your sin. And he stripped us bare of all of our subdiffusions and left us naked before God in all of our iniquity. The teaching of Jesus Christ condemns us one and all. No, our condition demands a far more radical cure than education can provide. Which brings us to what Anselm taught us in his classic book, Cardeus Homo. Why did God become man? He became man because of the fact that the sin of man is an infinite sin. Now he was not merely referring to the fact that if you take the tens upon tens of thousands of sins of thought and word and deed of omission and commission which are piled up over the heads of every one of us and add them all together into a gigantic mountain that it would be almost infinite in nature He's talking more than that. He's talking about the fact that the least sin against an infinitely holy being such as God demands an infinite penalty. And I tremble when I think of the fact that to take the name of Christ blasphemously is to invite upon one's head an infinite and eternal wrath, and justly so. Such a being as God, his name should never be thought of being taken in vain. And I think that when the scribes in the Old Testament copied the scriptures, that when they came to any of the names of God, they paused, they knelt and prayed, and then they wrote that name. But when they came to the Tetragrammaton, to that four-letter word Yahweh, which we spell as Jehovah, the great ultimate name of God Almighty, they first laid aside their pen, took off their clothes, bathed, put on clean clothes, took a new pen, dipped it into ink, and with much prayer wrote the four letters of Yahweh, Jehovah. 
and today the name of God is bandied about and falls trippingly from the lips of blasphemers everywhere in this society. It is broadcast in our motion pictures and television and radio daily, and my soul trembles for such who have committed such infinite offenses against an infinite God and have brought an infinite penalty upon their heads. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The sin of man is an infinite sin. And secondly, said St. Anselm, it therefore demands an infinite payment since the penalty must match the crime. There must be an infinite payment made for infinite sin. But it is thirdly man who has sinned, not a lamb or a bull or a goat. And all of the bulls and lambs that died upon a thousand altars of antiquity could never pay for the slightest sins of man. It is man that sinned, it is man that must pay. But how can man who is finite ever pay an infinite penalty? One way is that he spend an infinite amount of time doing so in hell. But is there another? How? In the short space of this world could any man pay such a penalty? Some years ago I read a fascinating story about the most popular sport in the world. I speak not of football, basketball, or baseball as we know them, but of soccer, which is without doubt the most popular sport in the world. And if you go to Europe or South America, you'll learn the truth of that statement. They have stadiums down there that dwarf the largest of our football stadiums where 300,000 or more people will gather to watch a soccer match and they go wild. And in the story, there was a World Cup, a final championship being played that year between Argentina and Brazil and being played in Argentina. And the game was tied until the very last seconds when one of the referees made a, an obviously erroneous call which led to a victory on the part of Argentina. Mudville was ecstatic compared to Brazil after that. They were not amused, to say the least. But time went on, and the months went by, and another year came, and another championship between the same two teams, this time played in Brazil. And the stadium was crowded with 300,000 people, at least 200,000 of which were Brazilians. And just to show that they were not unhappy, one wealthy Brazilian had donated a large sum of money to, to print up the most beautiful programs that they had ever seen. They were large and the covers were so glossy they just shone. It was a magnificent piece of work. And the game was very close again. In fact, it was tied down to the very final seconds of the game and the same referee made an obviously false call again, which was the pre-arranged signal. And all of the Brazilians lifted their programs like mirrors. The glossy covers focused the rays of the sun and 200 mirrors focused their light upon that referee who went and disappeared in a puff of smoke. At least, so the story went. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, that is precisely what would happen to any 
mere mortal finite man who endeavored to pay an infinite payment. He would simply disappear instantly. He would be extinguished. What was needed was an infinite man. And so he came, the God-man, the Theanthropos, the creator, creature joined forever. And so he went to that cruel hill called Golgotha, soaked with the blood of criminals and scattered with the bones of miscreants, murderers, and the offscarring of the human race. And there they laid him on the cross and they took those spikes and hammers and they began to pound them through his flesh. And ah, dear one, those blows ringing down through the corridors of the centuries have awakened countless souls that were asleep in their sins to the deadly peril of their condition and have smashed and broken the hard hearts of many sinners and caused them to yield themselves unto the Savior. Do you hear those blows today? Ah, uh, will you not awaken out of the sleep of sin and death while there's still time before it is everlastingly too late? And that cross was set up in place, and then 200,000 billion trillion suns focused, as it were, the wrath of God into the very core of the soul of the God-man there upon the cross, and Christ suffered in body and soul an infinite wrath, an infinite penalty. We may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us. He hung and suffered there, and the penalty ultimately was paid in full and the forgiveness of God could be freely proffered to all that would believe, to all that would cast themselves before that cross and invite the Savior to come into their hearts. That, that execrable place of Calvary, of Golgotha, that horrible blood-stained hill became the place where the rose of Sharon blossomed and a fountain was opened that brings cleansing and life eternal to all that will trust in him alone for their salvation. Have you received him? Has that rose blossomed in your heart? Have you trusted in him alone as your savior? Have you repented of your sins? and cast yourself before him, saying, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to thee. Take me and make me wholly thine. The least sin against the infinite holiness and honor of God is demanding of an infinite penalty. Ah, dear one, how shall you pay it? Ah, guilty one, how shall you pay this debt? Thou hast nothing to pay, and shalt be cast into the prison house of sin and death and hell until thou hast paid all. Or else you shall bow before the God-man who paid it for you. What thou, my Lord, hast suffered, was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was a transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor, vouchsafe to me thy grace. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy 
pity without end. Oh, make me thine forever. And should I fainting be, oh, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. May we pray. This, O oh God, is why thou didst become man. O oh God, may there be no one here who shall look upon such infinite suffering, such infinite mercy and grace, and turn his back and die impenitently without hope except to pay that penalty himself forever. May some right now be awakened from the lethargy of their sleep of death. And may they say, O oh Lord Jesus, I am the sinner for whom thou hast suffered so much. Have mercy upon me and forgive me. Come, I yield myself to thee. Set up thy throne in my heart and be thou my Savior and my God. Henceforth it is my great delight to follow thee. In thy name, amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.